Dennis, your CTO of Blitz Metrics, and I've known you a long while. You're going to talk to us about growing through uh, growing through Facebook and Instagram marketing. So I first met Dennis uh, when I visited Yahoo Personals in 2005. And his title back then really intrigued me. It a most unusual title. His business card read Data Miner. That was all that was on your card. It's like, what is a data miner? Of course, now we know. That's a very important part of, uh, of what we do, looking at data and seeing patterns and understanding people. But that was a very progressive and early title for you. So he writes for Adweek, Social Media Examiner, and 3Q Digital, among others, and has worked with Blitz Metrics for the last 14 years, focusing on Facebook and Insta marketing. I don't know anyone else who has focused on Facebook marketing longer than Dennis, and I regard Dennis as an inside guy for Facebook marketing strategy. And he's, I should know, also on the Cortland Brooks team, by the way. So Dennis, if you'd like to take it away, I will uh, bow out and let you have the floor. Thank you, sir. Pleasure. <laughs> you know, the cool thing about working at Yahoo and being able to see you come on the campus and go on hikes and, and learn from you is that we had more data than anybody else. So technically, we were running ads and doing campaigns for Yahoo Personals, but we had everything for Yahoo Search, all the search logs. We had everyone who was running PPC and all the data. And I learned so much because maybe it's a Chinese wall or maybe today it's illegal, but back then, I was able to see all the keywords that Match.com was buying on PPC and be able to use them for Yahoo Personals. And I saw, for example, the intersection between Adult Friend Finder versus dating sites versus people that were looking for information on relationships or their marriage or committing suicide or other things. So it just gave me an interesting view that I think is very unique because I've got access to all the search engine data and we're running campaigns for the different properties, which include Yahoo personals. And we're doing, we're taking all of our house inventory, which is inventory that's on yahoo.com and being able to do things like retargeting to build that system. So when Facebook came along in May of 2007, which I think, does that make it however many years, a long time that we've been running at 14, 15 years, we were the first to do Facebook ads because no one could have done it earlier than that. We learned about how the data and the algorithm works and how it's changed over time. There used to be 37 different types of ads and we were running ads when I left Yahoo, we were running ads for all the major players. Some of them we were running direct. Some of them we were running through these different affiliate networks, you know, like a Neverblue or Commission Junction or affiliate.com and these other folks. And what I've learned in the, in the we spent a billion dollars on Facebook ads, which is crazy, of other people's money, right? Which gave us access to see like, what is it to drive a profile versus a conversion versus driving people to install an app and, everything else that, that you might look at in terms of the data that's available as you cross search and social and email and that kind of thing. But what's, what I wanted to talk about today is what is working on Facebook because the stuff that worked before with cheap app installs for under a dollar or getting traffic for dollar, two dollar CPM so you can get these profiles at you know two dollars or three dollars like the, those days are not possible because of privacy in GDPR that's rolling across the world because of iOS 14, because you can't get that retargeting data anymore. And 95% of people that get the prompt say, do not allow, right? So you're not getting that. I mean, there's things like the conversion API, there's Google Chrome with their pixel. There's all kinds of technical things that make it harder to market from a data perspective, because the, the big picture over the next year you're going to see is having individual user conversions being passed back from your site or from your app is not going to be possible. So you'll see things where Facebook and Google are passing back conversions in these groups. So because they're anonymizing who exactly it is and passing it back in groups, and they're also delaying the, the time, it, they're not giving those, those pingbacks like they used to immediately. So you have to start using URL parameters. You have to use the conversion APIs that are built into your marketing automation systems so that you're not relying upon the browser to pass back that data, which then helps you be able to optimize. There's all this stuff on the technical level that has to happen because the, the data that we were relying upon that came from Facebook is largely no longer available. A lot of the targeting is not available. You guys know that with dating sites, that you have to register, your ads have to be pre-approved. The wild west of what we had before 
where we would literally find the most popular pictures on hot or not and turn them into dating ads, right? Because why not? I mean, these are the most popular pictures. They worked on hot or not, then we'll just run them in our ads. That, that kind of stuff doesn't work as well. So I want to, well, I can't even do that anymore. So I'm going to show you a few things from a strategy standpoint. And then if we have some time, I'm going to show you some specific examples of the types of ads and marketing that are working on Facebook, which includes the whole ecosystem of Facebook of Instagram and WhatsApp and Messenger and whatnot. And hopefully you will see a path that is shining, that is still viable, that other dating sites and people in the world of relationships just aren't using. So does that sound good to me and or to you? And I'd love to see in the Q&A the, the questions that you have, which we'll handle along the way. So I'm going to share my screen. So this structure is what we call the topic wheel. And in the center is the brand. In the center is the subscription, it's the product, it's getting people to buy. But people are not interested in direct selling. And I've got a, a client of, of ours who used to sell a course that was on basically as a pickup artist, how do you have, you know, get any girl you want or you know, how do you go on 100 dates to convert the most. And he had to change it because he and he's canceled for Me Too, for ad disapprovals because it's predatory because you, you can't market with those kinds of messages anymore. So he changed it to something along the lines of, you know, the, the confident man or, you know, the, the leadership um, men or, or other kinds of, of terms that, that are more positive and look less exploitative or, or less like people are, you know, like guys that are prowling or this kind of thing. And so you turned it also into a podcast. So you have all these different topics. So imagine instead of the direct site where you're trying to get people to convert, create a profile and subscribe, you have topics that are tangential. So it could be what you do when you're depressed or when you move to a new city or other kinds of things that you know are more informational that are more kind of lead gen oriented. And you use these lead gen microsites that you produce to collect emails and then you can nurture and do whatever you want inside the email right and a lot of you guys know and have strong email marketing programs but email we think is is critical instead of running direct so you can see here you know if you're running dating ads you got to go through this application there's all these different rules on what you're allowed to do what you're not allowed to do but notice here that and this is not this is not a way of trying to like go around their rules or you know cheat the system, but you can see clearly they say here that policy doesn't apply to products and services that are around literature or entertainment around relationships. So think about what that means. <clears throat> Most people at the first level will think this means well people that are selling <clears throat> info products magazines that have articles that are around relationships that are really like advertorials like you know Gillette we ran campaigns for <coughs> on you know grooming tips which is or how do you prepare for your first date which obviously is is good for Yahoo personals and it was back in the day you know it's good for Gillette because they own 95% of the men's grooming market but when you do partnerships with these other folks and this is an extension of social and PR and SEO, I consider that all kind of like wrapped together, paid ads, SEO, PR, social are all kind of the same thing. There's something that Facebook has, it's called branded partnerships and brand collaborations. Have you guys seen that? So that means an influencer or some person or another page can tag you in that particular post as a branded sponsored post and then you have the ability to be able to advertise against that particular post as if it was that particular person. So we've done collaborations with other people that are well known in a particular area. And then we will be able to boost that post, put URL parameters on the links and be able to track how much traffic is coming to a newsletter, to a landing page, to a microsite, to a vanity domain, email. And then that email sequences all the way through to when we might say, you know, or there could be the nine ways on how you can find the woman of your dreams. And you have these different tips, like, you know, get better clothes and you know, get in the right mindset and exercise and sign up for this one particular site, right? So that is still white hat. A lot of dating folks, two or three ago, because of what happened with GDPR and the whole Cambridge Analytica thing, they said, you know, we can't 
can't seem to drive traffic on <clears throat> Facebook on the paid side, or we have to pay these people on Instagram to be able to promote these things and put the links in the profile. But there a strategy that we've tried with other personal brands to then use these as affiliates. So we think of these personal brands as really like micro publishers. So what I've done, for example, just to demonstrate from my own example, some clients we can show and some we can't, is we run a SaaS platform that has action um, on you know Facebook ads and Google ads and Tag Manager and all that kind of technical stuff on how do you get all your tracking in place and optimize your data. And we have different topics. So this is kind of like Fight Club. So we don't talk directly about our membership group and you know what do you get for $100 a month and that kind of thing. Instead, we have these different topics that we, we care about. And we're on podcasts, we're interviewing other people that are knowledgeable in those particular topics. So this is a, this is a deeper content strategy thing that needs to be driven by you as a dating company CEO. Going to be your marketing manager. This is not going to be your your CMO. This is not going to be freelancers or agencies that you have, and it's something that has to be driven by you, but executed by them. So when we think about the topic wheel, who are all the people that we have in our network as experts that our community trusts? So the the people that we want to be able to influence, who are looking, you know, they're they're singles, they're black, they're gay, they're moving, they're you know. They're even on Mark's list 20 years ago, <laughs> if you remember. Who is it that this inception? So it's the dream inside the dream. So who the, the audience we want to reach, who do they trust? And can we create content with those people? And I'm not saying influencer, because I, because influencer implies that they have a lot of followers. I'm talking about they have the trust of a particular community, not just because they're Jake Paul and they have 80 million followers on Instagram or something like that. So I have you know, managing people, the CEO of American Airlines, or, you know, education, professors that we're working with to be able to teach, or, you know, digital marketing, it could be friends of mine. So we're creating this kind of content, and we're publishing it on their public figure pages, so then we can boost it, use it as a branded collaboration, and then be able to boost those posts to drive to landing pages that are on their site, or on vanity domains that we have. That way we can never get in trouble. And it's never driving straight directly to dating because dating is just, as you guys know, your stuff gets disapproved all the time. Even if your stuff is legit, it gets disapproved all the time. And then once you're in Facebook jail, it's very hard to get out. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? And <clears throat> we've been doing this for six or seven years now, this particular strategy. <clears throat> and I'm gonna show you kind of what that looks like. Even who are professional digital marketers don't understand this and they get this wrong. So here, let's look at my profile. I'm gonna show you this real quick. And you can see this is me, 5,000 friends is the limit. News, right, this is my profile here. You know, I'm posting, so I'm on other people's podcasts. I'm on, you know, they're on my podcast. We're constantly creating content around figureheads, right? So this is the kind of stuff that you see. I get shout outs from these other people. So this is the profile. This is something that you log into. This is what a user has. There's no ads or analytics associated with the user profile, right? It's a regular account. But we create many of these public figures. A public figure is a page. It's a Facebook page. See, it's a page that has my name, that has someone else's name, and we'll take people that we know that are in our community. I'm not saying someone has to be a real person. It could be you as a CEO. It could be other people on your team. It could be people in your network. And the odds are, you know, if they're they're well enough known and respected. Odds are they've got a profile. Maybe they're on LinkedIn, maybe they have a Wikipedia, but they probably don't have a public figure page, which is a business page that has their name. So it's called Dennis U Dating Service. This is called, and so when you look at what's what we're posting on this company page, this company page is, you know, the type is a public figure page. It could be really any type of company page cross-posted from Instagram. We have other VAs that are coming here and they're posting things. And we're, it, you can't tell that this is a public figure page because it's very personable. It looks like a profile. Now there will be some semi-promotional piece of content. It'll be promoting someone else's book. It'll be promoting some piece of information. And then we can boost that particular post. The thing that works best on the boosting is 
And most people don't understand what possible with video here. So if I go here to the and I look at the videos that are here, and imagine you've got a whole stable of public figure pages. So remember, I'll come back here. You've got all these public figure pages, and each of them relationship with that person, but you've created a public figure page in their name, or they have, or they've given you access, and then you start posting from all these different sites, and you're telling stories of people's, you know, I moved to Atlanta, and I started this new job, and here's what happened, and I used Match.com as part of my thing, and I'm, you know, and it's not a testimonial because you're telling a story. It actually is a testimonial, but you don't call it a testimonial. You're making it fun. You're making it, it just like, you know, your favorite movie or TV show, you know, saying, oh, that was a really good piece of content. No, you say that was a great performance. I really enjoyed the song. I liked, you know, what a Phantom of the Opera, one of my favorite shows, you know, that was really moving. I don't say that was really great content for two hours, right? So we're telling lots of these stories. They're talking about, well, not all of them, but a lot that you'll have on these will be talking about talking about a lead magnet, talking about whatever it might be. And the ones that you really like, you're going to post. So for example, we've done some stuff with Grant Cardone. Grant Cardone, sales and influence and whatnot, you're going to see that, you know, like here. So this one is an example of something that's basically a testimonial, but it's not a testimonial. It doesn't look like a testimonial. And this is promoting our one minute video course on how do you create one minute videos that are engaging and that instead see a direct ad, which is what would have worked 15 years ago, was it 15, 14 and a half years ago when we first started running ads on Facebook, would have been, hey, sign up for this one thing. This is really great. It's a direct call to action, but you have to be indirect now. So in this case, I'm having Grant Cardone promote our, promote our different concepts, talk about what it means to do any, you know, any of the different courses we talk about. So here's an example of one where we're doing this, and it could be on his profile or ours. So listen to this. Yes. Here we go. Hey guys, Dennis wanted me to send you this uh, one best one minute tip. But you gotta be authentic, you gotta be transparent, you gotta get people to attention. I'm like, hey! Session setting. Uh, it might be more like making a big claim. Okay, I guarantee you, you got to punch. You got to have a hook. You got to get excited. So, and let me just say this: all that being said, you got to get out there. Okay, hey, you got to be great. Ten X everything. Think at ten X levels. And get Dennis you. See what I do? I keep getting your attention. He's a bad, bad man. And that's a little girl right there. She got free. And that used to be great food on my plate. So you can see that that's a post. That's a public figure page, not my profile, because you can't run ads on a profile. And you can see that we're boosting these particular posts, right? So it got 130,000 people. To engage some people are clicking on this some people are learning about it some of them were retargeting because people who are who watch a particular video you can say anyone who watched this video I want to show them this video or send them this link you guys understand retargeting on email web native audiences right and then I can use any of the other campaigns I have in combination to be able to run ads against this so when you have this kind of content it doesn't feel like an ad because if I'm targeting people who are fans of Grant Cardone and they're seeing Grant Cardone, then they're gonna say like, well, I like Grant Cardone and that's Grant Cardone. Now he's talking about Dennis, he's a bad, bad man that we need to do here, right? And why is this link not clicking? But you can see that we've taken these posts and we'll continue to boost them and you'll see the performance of these where you can see like 123,000 people saw this through plays at 33,000, which is a quarter. That's about normal, what we'd expect. And so we're generating these video views at less than a penny. I started out, it was about half a cent as the ad started to burn out because we were too much. It, it went up to like a penny and a half or two cents. So imagine you're getting a through play, which is a 15 second view where someone's providing relationship tips or any, any kind of content that you have, right? Or how do you get more careful like you know how to get more women in bed like you can't can't do topics like that you, you like it used to work you will just get canceled and reported 
the algorithm notices you're doing that or enough people click the X on your, your content. Like you just can't do stuff like that. And once you get in Facebook jail, like just see that all the time people come to me saying, hey, can you get me out of Facebook jail? Our ad account got banned. Like 20 webinars on what do you do to not get banned or when you get banned, you know, your ads gets, get disapproved or you get suspended. What do you do? Like don't, don't come to me, by the way, if that happens. That's not the thing that I, that's a whole nother thing to talk about. And dating is just really hard. But the key is doing this so it's information and it's coming from other people that they trust. And this is not a typical influencer kind of campaign. Most influencer campaigns is, oh, I'm going to pay this pretty girl and she's going to make five posts on Instagram and I'm going to pay her $5,000 and then I hope organically her audience is big enough that some people will sign up for the dating site. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about other people that you know, paying them or not to expertise where they are associated with you and you are boosting that post from your profile or any of these other public figure pages that you control. So we have a whole library of all of these pages that we're able to boost from and then remarket within this whole ecosystem of pages. So it's not a one page strategy, it's a many page constellation ecosystem strategy. So if I go to facebook.com slash pages slash manage, you'll see that we have of these pages that we use on behalf of our clients. And you might find that you have complementary relationships because you know customers, their customers are similar to your customers or vice versa. So we have clients in cosmetic surgery and in beauty that are giving beauty tips that we can then cross promote and put podcasts and webinars together where they talk about a particular topic and then cross their audiences, collect email addresses between them, right? So some of these are big pages that have several million followers. Here's Let this is, this is a big one. Nathan Latka, you may know he's one of the big SaaS founders. Pitbull, Pitbull is in his songs from the '90s, right? This guy ruled the clubs. Anyway, and you have people like me. You have all of these different sorts of pages that we're able to, with their permission, change.org. Obviously, we wouldn't put any dating-related stuff on change.org. We get in trouble on that one. Or Ashley Furniture. That there's no relationship between. Oops. What happened? There's no relationship between you know buying furniture and, and dating tips. But imagine this ecosystem, different topics. So you're going from from this dating site right now, you know, find these three matches free, or you know, whatever it might be, to the topics that are informational. So it's more YouTube-ish, but one minute tips, 15 second stories that work as Instagram stories. By the way, this strategy works on Twitter for video. You can reuse it on Snapchat, on TikTok, on all the other social networks because it's video oriented. It just happens to be where we've pioneered it on Facebook and we just see Facebook as kind of the, the actual, kind of like Google's the king of search. So kind of working on Facebook, you can, by the way, you can get away with this on TikTok and, and whatnot. And they haven't yet clamped down on this. Full disclosure, they're a client of ours, TikTok and, and Snapchat. So this video strategy will work across of accounts, but you have these topics, which are the spokes that go into the hub, which is your product. And then the outside, the tire, the outside of this wagon wheel, this is called the topic wheel, are those little stories that are with these other people so it doesn't feel like an ad. But the idea of Facebook advertising is running, say, conversion ads, or you're boosting those posts so that you can still get the 50 conversions per ad set per week so that it can optimize to your conversion, cost per conversion, or you know, cost per profile of $4, cost per paying subscriber of $50, you know, wherever it might be. It's gonna come through remarketing audiences and it's gonna come through things that don't look like ads. So the main point of what I wanna share here today is creating content that doesn't look like ads. And that means you've gotta have a content library to be able to collect these things fill out this content strategy so you feel like a publisher but really you're an advertiser because in DR you have to, during a direct response you have to get people to sign up you're not you know coca-cola talking about polar bears or something you need to drive sales but to do that you've got to have integrated in your process when you sign up you're monitoring social media when people are saying positive things so you want to capture that you want to ask their permission you want to monitor Twitter Facebook Instagram whatnot and this is not just reputation management. This is not just looking for people that are mentioning you, but this is being proactive with your members. And maybe inside your email sequences, new member sequences, you could say, hey, you know, I'd love to love to feature you or interview you, or one of the customer service reps can say, hey, I just wanted to make, you know, to see how you guys, depending if the business financially, the business model supports that. 
but you collect these little pieces of feedback. One of my favorite things to do is take a random sample of people who have just signed up before they've had a chance to experience it, but you know, and, and get them on a Zoom call for five minutes and say, what was it that inspired you to join? And you record that because you run it through Otter.ai or Descript or whatever your transcription services are, and you listen exactly for those words. And they'll say, I signed up because of this situation that happened with my boyfriend and I came out of this other relationship, blah, blah, blah. So you take those exact words and that becomes your ad copy. That becomes the landing pages. Like literally you're using the customers to generate your ads, to generate videos, to ask them about their successes, to congratulate them. And then that creates content that you then use inside your content library. You say to some of them and you create this as part of the topic wheel. We'll reach out to influencers that you know are not A tier influencers, but like B and C, and just, just say thank you and congratulate them. And they love sharing their content. They love being featured. Like imagine being featured as a success story over here, but not, not as a testimonial, but someone who's giving a tip. So you're actually elevating them. So it's almost like you're a journalist and it's saying, you know, how Dr. Adrian was able to, you know, do whatever. It, it's, it's informational and it's not a testimonial. Like if the minute it smells like a, a testimonial, it's just not going to work. Okay boost these posts like you see a Grant Cardone post or you know dating tips one I think the dating tips one is the key one because then you just have one tip or like three tips in 15 seconds one two three and that's it right not a 30 minute one hour webinar podcast 90% of them you're gonna kill so you're gonna put out 10 at a time maybe and if you're really good you put out like a hundred put out batches of these 90% of them just don't work because they don't you just can't tell what's going to win, okay? Like you think you might know, you never know, right? You, this is the whole thing with advertising, especially on Facebook. You just you just cannot pick winners. You just let the system determine it for you. The AI is so smart. You don't have to do sub-targeting. You literally just hit lookalike audiences and custom audiences. That's it. I don't target people that are Mormons or blacks or whatever. That's not even going to be legal anymore. But you percent of them because they don't have a, a good cost per click or good cost per lead or a good cost per through play video. And the ones that are working, the remaining 10%, you put more money on it. So you start with $5 a day or $10 a day. We like to run things for a week. So it can, because we want to get past the learning phase, because learning phase to get to conversion, you may never get there. But looking at initial factors on what used to be relevant score, but now is three factors. I basically look at click through rate and the base CPM. If our base CPM is below $5, that's pretty good. If it's above 15 or 20, that means there's something wrong. Like we're getting negative feedback, the click-through rate's low, the watch time's low. There, there's there's all these other factors that basically boil back into the average CPM that you're paying for your ads. And by the way, if this is too technical, then we have a whole course on it too. Mark wanted me to go the oil. We talk about you know the the pros, what the pros are doing with Facebook ads. So that's what I wanted to show you. Expand and others you're going to switch by switching to another audience. So maybe something's initially top of funnel, but then later you're going to turn into a remarketing audience. So we could say people watch video A, then show them this particular kind of ad. The only remarketing audiences that are post level are on. So when I have a post that I'm boosting or running for conversion, I can't retarget the people on that particular post who engaged on that post unless it's got a video in it. So that's a key reason why you want to run video. But you shouldn't run only video. You can run carousel. You can run Facebook lead ads, which don't seem to work quite as well for, for dating. If you find it's working, I'd love to hear about that. I haven't seen it work in the last couple of years. And then stack boosting is when you have a post that's working well, you create another boost against it, or you, you turn it into a conversion ad. You can use the same ad many, many times in many different places. And a stable of these winners that you may spend 50000 100000 on. We have some ads that we spent a million dollars on, which is kind of cool, but hundreds and sometimes thousands of these ads to be able to find these kinds of winners. I love seeing what other people are doing. What we'll do is we'll look at the Facebook ads library and, you know, this research, by the way, you don't use some third party tool, you use Facebook's own ads library tool. So if I can look at, you know, Donald Trump and see, you know, what Donald Trump is doing and how he spent, where's he? Yeah, so he spent $100 million. I can see all his ads, right? I can do this for anybody. I can look at match, oops, match.com, right? I can look, I can look you up, right? And see what they're doing. So you can see for the ads that they're running, most are going very ad looking kinds of things like you see here, but the smart ones are using video. 
And what the ads library won't do is show you which pages are connected to that ad account where you're doing the branded collaborations. If you're afraid that you're gonna do stuff that other people could then be able to see, because we can see what they're doing here, when you're doing the collaborations that I'm showing you, it's a good way to go under the radar where they don't really know what you're doing. So you can see that Match is running these ads. You can see the frequency. If you see they've been running an ad a long time, you don't see the spend unless it's political or one of these other categories. Cell phone videos that are vertical, right? That's what's working. These guys could do better, by the way. But I think it's because, you know, this big corporate kind of thing. They don't understand it anymore. See details about what we're doing. But you'll you'll see the ads that are doing the best, they are, they're going to be reusing. So when you see that, that same creative being reused, that gives you a hint. So you want to understand what... The and I'm not saying that you should try to copy what everyone else is doing, but I think this is great market research. People are spending a lot of money on Facebook marketing, and we're finding in some cases not a lot of joy right now. So especially when we're occasionally uh, apps are getting shut down, uh, that Facebook's not been uh, particularly fun and friendly towards the dating industry. There was a period in which we got entirely shut down uh, a few years back, and uh, yeah. the majors got whitelisted. And basically, it was because of the, uh, you know, too many people were hitting the complaint button, basically saying they weren't happy with the particular ads. And there's a, you know, I can understand it. There was some shenanigans going on as well, bait and switch and what have you. Um, so uh, things are a little bit more difficult for especially startup dating ads on Facebook. Um, so I like this approach. It's good. What you're essentially doing is saying use video, test a lot. Use interstitials. Uh, I'm not sure it's the right terminology, but basically have um, a path to uh, building an audience and building an email list, yeah. and and then do the more explicit marketing, uh, the more direct, uh, you know, dating app marketing. Um, so let me look at questions. Have we got any questions? Um, I've got one for you. How do you approach an influencer and pitch them on creating a video? Typically, essentially, they're influencers. They're people who have a a following of some scale, and yeah. you've got a page which you control and own, and then you are appealing to them to do a video. Tell us about that appeal. How did you get Grant to do a video, for example? <laughs> okay, so first off, most people, their approach is, is wrong to begin with. So we don't want to call these people influencers, because the minute you say influencer, it means you pay them, and I don't like to pay people is I'd love to have you on my podcast, your latest book. So for example, I have all my friends who have these books on whatever it might be. I'm in this book too. This is the most popular book on Facebook advertising. Or it could be, you know, this guy here or this friend of mine, Sebastian Rusk, he, he wrote a book on how do you podcast, right? So I'm interviewing him. So I'm not paying people for, for this, but instead I want to interview them on Zoom for 15 minutes and ask them questions about their thing. Now what happened is, or the end of that particular video, is when people say lots of positive things. So when I'm gonna interview somebody, I'm gonna say, Sebastian Rusk is one of the best people at podcasts, and podcasts suck if you don't have one, right? All kinds of great things about him to introduce him, and then we'll talk about ideas that are in his book, and then along the way, he's going to say something positive about me or about us or about my company or about the topics that we talk about or of content that we've created. And what we're looking for is being able to pull those little snippets out and being able to run those as basically advertorials, those little 15 second stories where he's saying something very positive about us, our company, our content, about any one of our people. And so that's really what we're trying to pull out of that long form content. Now to do that, you need someone else who has enough caliber that when they reach out to known or to a Jake Paul or to whoever it is, that that's going to create value, right? If you don't have enough clout and you reach out to a grant, he's going to say, well, it's going to be $100,000 and you got to talk to my publicist or something like that, right? But I get it for free because I have enough power in the world of digital marketing that I can reach out to just, I mean, maybe not like Elon Musk, but I could reach out to most people and they see all the people that I've interviewed and that I'm with. So you need a relationship with someone who is at, at the mid tier or higher to reach out on behalf of you to book all of those interviews. And if you're the CEO, then by definition, you're the figurehead. So you should be talking about the, the bigger industry trends or what's, so don't talk about just your product. Talk, 
talk, you know, don't talk just about the dating app, talk about the, the bigger things, talk about how the pandemic has changed dating and what, what you're, you know, have a research report on, you know, fewer marriages are happening or like whatever it is. It's like some interesting tidbit that, that you want to be able to share. And then that drives people in. Gotcha. Interesting. It's really very authentic and very compelling content and really where it seems yeah. the advertising industry is moving because we've lost lots of ways to uh, have attribution. You know, we're losing that. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, another question, have you found a way to get better results on Facebook ads as custom uh, lookalike audience start to lose its effectiveness due to its privacy changes to the privacy changes? So when you are passing back conversions because of the way you're managing events, so there's, there's aggregated events now that Facebook's passing back to us. And there's things that you want to do inside your Google Tag Manager that includes all the different events across Google and Facebook and whatnot, and things you want to tie in with your CRM or how you track conversions. If that's being passed back to Facebook, you don't have to use lookalike audiences anymore. You don't have to micro-target. You don't have to, tar well, I mean, technically for dating, you still have to target that they are single or the undecided, you, obviously you can't target people who are married, Madison, that kind of stuff. Rules on, on dating apps, but outside of those, you don't have to sub-target. Like literally, if you pass back conversion and you have good content, the content will do the targeting because it, it's all about the content now. So it's not that the machinery of the advertising is harder to use, it's that the it, it's so competitive now, the algorithm's looking for engagement that we need to create things that don't look like ads. So short little entertaining videos, that's why TikTok's taking off. Short 15 second vertical videos that look like they're on a cell phone. The people that engage with that, um, the targeting that drive, because friends of those people are the ones that Facebook's gonna show. So you're literally just gonna run most of your ads as untargeted or against custom audiences. But even custom audiences aren't as strong as they used to be, as you know. On Facebook, at least, you're losing 20 to 30% of those audiences. Great. Um, well, let me ask another question here. We've got to, uh, yeah, are there legal issues to consider, i.e., if you get someone to do a video or podcast for you, do you have to get them to sign a disclaimer for you to be able to promote the post? Yep, I'm not a lawyer, but what we've done for the last 10 years, we've advised clients on this, I've spoken at conferences about this for a long time, is we get something that's called lightweight permission. So if someone is in a Zoom call or it's in a podcast or maybe on Twitter, someone says something nice, you say, wow, thank you so much, Mark. Can I quote you on that? Winky face. Why, yes, it would be a pleasure, Dennis. I've known you for many years or you know, whatever it is. And so that's, that's consent. And then usually when you ask them for permission, they also come on and, and say something else positive on top of that. So you could say, wow, I love this podcast so much. I would love to chop up bits of it and place it on your social media. Is that okay with you? And they'll say, why, yes, I would love to. So you, you make it very lightweight. You put it in that moment. And now you have a video recording of them giving you consent. So yes, Great. you need consent. Now, some people who will go further, like the bigger corporations will then actually send over this DocuSign thing with the release form and all that. Now you could do that. We see a lot of the conferences will do that. But we found for social media to use these lightweight snippets, it, if you literally just get the consent at the moment, that's been good enough. Of, and you know, knock on wood, I've never seen anybody get in trouble for using lightweight consent. We've done it tens of thousands of times. Great, perfect. Uh, and uh, one question from Benjamin Goodman. Goodman. If you don't have a podcast or YouTube channel, do you recommend paying the taste makers, for lack of a better term? So I have great news for you. All you have to do is right now just say, I have a podcast. It's the best, right? Whatever. It's just literally declare you have a podcast. Why? <clears throat> because all you need to do is create a video. If all you have is a cell phone or whatever it is, or you have your laptop, you don't have to have, like, I've got this whole studio with all sorts of things in here. You don't, you know, you don't need all this other kind of stuff here. You, you literally just need this. Just declare that you have a podcast, right? And then collect the videos as you go. Don't worry about, you know, Spotify and iTunes and all the, you know, Descript.com and all the editing. Don't worry. Just literally say you have a podcast. That's good enough. Just right. to collect the data. You just, just want to collect the video. That's all. 